So, hi, I'm Tim. Um, people online might know me as Mithro. Um, and I'm actually going to start this talk with questions for the audience. Um, FPGA is a kind of an interesting topic, um, and I want to understand who's in the audience so I can spend more time on the parts that maybe um, you don't understand. So, uh, maybe if my slides were in advance. Um, so, who here knows what an FPGA is? And it's perfectly fine to say no. Um, cool. Who's actually used an FPGA in a project? Okay, so I was thinking about 90% of the people in this room. Um, who's used a lattice FPGA? Okay. Uh, no. Um, so maybe about four people. Um, who's used a Xilex FPGA? Okay, that's the one that was used last year. Um, so that's most of the room. Um, that's good feedback for Lattice. Um, <laughs> uh, who has heard of the SimbiFlow project before today? A few people. Um, who has heard of Project Ice Storm before the day? About a quarter. Cool. So because there's definitely somebody in the room who is in the wrong place and doesn't know what FPGA is. I'm going to start with what an FPGA is from my point of view. And I'm a software developer, and I love FPGAs because they convert hardware problems into software problems. So they convert this horrible mess into this beautiful ones and zeros. Um, more importantly, I'm a human, and one of the themes um, from this talk has been that as humans, we're terrible at doing pretty much everything. Um, we write lots of bugs. And the great thing about software is you can fix the bugs at a later date and erase their existence. Whereas hardware, you can kind of see it's a bit harder to patch. Um, I also want to mention this. Um, FPGAs come in all sizes. Um, there's kind of this perception that FPGAs are these giant things that live in data centers. Um, this bag has 50-ish FPGAs in it. Um, a project I've been talking about at LCA is this ICE40 based FPGA Tomu that is about 100 times bigger than the real size. Um, they're about this big. Um, so FPGAs come in all sizes, and FPGAs are useful in applications from small IoT level things up to giant, you know, data center, um, you know, phase arrays, radar, and pretty much anything in between. Um, the problem is people aren't really using FPGAs for these, and I think I know why. Um, so with that introduction, I want to introduce SimbiFlow, which is the project I'm talking about today. Um, the first thing is SimbiFlow is really a community, a group of people that has a bunch of projects. These projects are going to come and go, um, but the, pro, uh, the community hopefully will continue to be around. And I am just one person in the community. All these people up here have contributed to the community in some way. Um, and this is important to understand because the only way for SimbiFlow to be successful is for the community to continue to grow and to have more people contribute to it. And so this is actually a recruiting talk for an open source project. And because people in here are probably more familiar with the software side of things, um, I'm going to use an analogy to um, software tool chains. This is kind of what software tooling looks like. You have your software, and then you have a compiler, and it kind of turns it into something that runs on a computer. And the compiler kind of has two parts. It has a front end, which passes the language, and probably some generic optimization stuff, and then probably a hardware-specific back end that targets something like whether you're targeting an ARM CPU or an x86 CPU or a MIPS 
type CPU. Um, and frequently, if things are well designed, you can share a lot of the front end and the generic optimizations um, between the thing, no matter which back end you're targeting. And if you've used LLVM or GCC, this is a pretty um, common approach. Um, so if you're developing C++, you've got your C++ software, it kind of goes into the front end, gets converted into some type of intermediate representation, probably has a whole bunch of generic C++ optimizations run over, and then if you're targeting x86, it goes into something that converts it into x86 assembly, and then into assembler, which converts it into something you can actually run on your computer. So this is kind of the pipeline you get when you're doing software. I mean, there's a whole bunch of really important details in there that I've glossed over, but for this analogy, that's um, kind of what you can think about. And so in EDA, which stands for Electronic Design Automation Tooling Ecosystem, this is kind of the same uh, things. So you've got your languages at the front, which are like your VHDL, your Verilog, your System Verilog. Then you have the synthesis tools, um, which generally take the language and convert it into an inter intermediate representation, um, which is generally called a netlist. Um, the synthesis tools also do a whole bunch of optimizations. And then you take that netlist and convert it into something that runs on a specific FPGA. Um, you can also convert it into something that can gets converted into an image, which you then send off to a, a um, very expensive manufacturing plant that gets you a real chip. And you also frequently use that output in things like verification, testing, and simulation. And so you can kind of see that it looks very similar. You've got your Verilog files. Say you're doing a Verilog system. It runs through the synthesis. Um, goes into FPGA backend, which converts it to a thing called FPGA assembly in our case, which then gets converted to what we call a bitstream, which is what you load onto the FPGA to make it work. And SymbiFlow is this full tool chain. It is a Verilog all the way to bitstream um, tool chain. And it's all completely open source. Um, it requires no vendor cooperation um, or any vendor tools to do this. Um, all the parts are open. And so I like to think of it as the GCC of FPGAs. Um, when GCC came about, it kind of enabled you to compile C, C++, other things um, for many different targets. Um, what I don't mean, though, is I'm not converting C, C++ into Verilog and running it on. I'm using it as an analogy. Um, it's a full tool chain that is free and open source. It's cross-platform. It's multi-platform. We're not just targeting one vendor's FPGAs. You should be able to use this tool chain for any vendor that is willing to contribute or any vendor the community is willing to support. And it should be pluggable and interchangeable. Um, I don't believe I'm the smartest person in this room. Um, I'm probably not even in the top percent, at ten percent, given how smart people are at LCA. So I think you guys can probably do a better job than I can at writing a lot of this stuff. And so I want to enable you to try and do that. And I challenge you to beat um, my crappy code, which should be pretty easy. So um, we definitely want it to be pluggable and interchangeable. And now I'm going to pause for a sec. Slide 26. So how did we get to this position? Well, it mostly started with a thing called Project iStorm that was created by a guy named Clifford Wolf. I'm not Clifford. Clifford is a very, very smart guy. He is way smarter than me. Um, and he decided to prove that you could, write, uh, you could create a fully open source tool chain for FPGAs. 
And previously it had been said that this was impossible to do, and he proved it wasn't. Um, they probably also said it was impossible to do an open source C compiler uh, back in the 80s. Um, it also was not possible to do that. Um, not impossible to do that. And so this is where it started. And then Clifford um, was, well, I targeted a small FPGA from Lattice, but as you know in this room, if you looked around when I was asking the questions, most of you have never heard or seen of a Lattice FPGA, but most of you have probably used a Xilex FPGA. And so he started doing a project to document the bitstream needed to um, support Xilex Series 7 FPGAs, and this was called Project X-Ray. Um, and this is kind of where SymbiFlow started. Um, we were now in a case where we were slowly getting documentation for multiple different types of FPGA bitstreams. We had some synthesis tools, but we kind of needed to start scaling up because we want to eventually support every FPGA out there. Um, and so we started SymbiFlow with the idea of trying to get more people to collaborate and to build a more modern uh, industry standard style uh, flow. And then in 34.3c, we launched, sorry, at 34.3c, um, we launched SymbiFlow. And this was a pretty big launch because it was the first time we could produce a bitstream for a Xilex Series 7 FPGA using completely open source tools. Um, all it could do was blink an LED, um, but it was the first step. The other important thing we did is we documented the process for documenting the Xilex Series 7 um, bitstream format. And that was really important because now there was a way to do this that other people could follow. You might have to change some of the steps depending on which tools you were using, um, but it kind of was reasonably well understood how you go about this. And then a guy called Dave Shah, who is very, very smart and young and energetic, decided to that he wanted to do another lattice part called the ECP5. And the ECP5 is kind of similar to the Xilex Series 7. It's made by lattice, but it's much cheaper. And him being a student, uh, price is fairly important. Um, and so Project X-Ray inspired him to document the bitstream for the ECP5. And because he's kind of young and energetic, he has kind of beaten us to supporting more things with ECP5 than we have with um, the Xilex parts. Then, because he wasn't happy with the place and route tool, which we were using um, called Verilog to routing, he went and wrote his own place and route tool, which is actually pretty good, called NextPNR. And so this is kind of where we're at. We have the SymbiFlow tool suite, um, which consists of the front end synthesis, the place and route tools, and the bitstream documentation. And then this thing I haven't really talked about called the architecture definitions yet. And so I'm gonna go more into what each of this means. So the bitstream documentation, which is um, Project iStorm, Project X-Ray, and Project Trellis, cover the fundamental binary format that you load onto an FPGA. Um, there's no point having all the other parts if you can't create something that you can actually use. And so bitstream documentation is really important for FPGA support, but it's not sufficient because you still need to be able to generate those bitstreams. And so the place and route tools are the things that map your design onto an FPGA, and we have two of them. Both of them are open source, both of them are timing driven, and uh, both of them accept 
the output of Yosis. Um, but nobody likes to write in, you know, net lists. Um, and so we support Yosis as the synthesis and mapping front end. At the moment, Yosis supports Verilog as the input. Um, Yosis doesn't support VHDL, so if you're from Europe, um, I'm afraid you're gonna have to learn a new language. Um, but Verilog's actually a pretty decent language as long as you never have to write it directly. <laughs> um, so um, I'd highly recommend looking at things like uh, Chisel, MeGen, MyHDL. There's plenty of ways to create Verilog without ever having to write Verilog. And despite me doing a lot of FPGA stuff, I very rarely write Verilog myself. Um, and you can then use the full toolchain. Um, the last thing is this weird thing called architecture definitions. And it turns out there are lots of different things in an FPGA. Um, there are basic things like lookup tables and flip-flops. Um, but there are more advanced things like DSP blocks and PCI Express hard blocks and all these type of things. At the moment, to understand them, you have to go and get the documentation from the vendor or use one of their um, wonderful GUI tools to generate the Verilog for that. And so the architecture definitions are designed to provide documentation simulation and verification of the actual functional units found in an FPGA. And so they're actually Verilog models of the stuff found in FPGAs. Um, we chose to write them in Verilog because that makes the documentation executable, which also means that it can be tested. Um, and so our documentation has tests. Um, it's obviously highly related to the bitstream documentation because the design of the part um, doesn't really matter if you don't know how to set the bits to configure it. Um, it's also related to the place and route because that's what takes your design and maps it to these um, descriptions. And it's also related to synthesis because synthesis has to know that these parts exist to map to it. Um, and so it's also related to um, verification and testing um, because we can do things like take your design, convert it to a bitstream, and connect it with architecture definitions by saying this bit turns on this feature, and then do logical equivalence checking to make sure our toolchain hasn't totally ruined your design. Um, and this is really powerful and something that all the proprietary vendors do with their own tooling, but not something they enable end users to generally do. And so this is a really cool thing that we can do with completely open source tools. And as I said, we're trying to make it so that we can test our documentation, because if you ever used the documentation from a proprietary vendor, you might find that version A is very different to version B, and um, it's frequently wrong. Um, and we would like tests to prevent our documentation getting wronger over time. Um, so what is the status? Um, you know what the parts are. What can you do? So. Back at the tooling, um, for the bitstream documentation, this is a summary of the status. I'm going to go through each one in a little bit of detail. Um, so the ladder size 40 was the first device to be supported. It's a little device um, ranging from around 1,000 for input lookup tables up to about 8,000 for input tables. We pretty much have complete documentation for everything found in those parts. There's a couple in the series that nobody's really used yet. Um, so nobody's done the documentation for those. Um, but definitely the base ICE40 
and the uh, ICE-40 Ultra Plus. The ICE-40 Ultra Plus is what's found on the FPGA Domu. Um, have complete documentation for everything, the I.O. blocks, the block RAM, the hard blocks, the DSP. Um, we also have Verilog models for all the parts in there. Um, we need, still need some help with what I'm calling replacement for tech libraries. Um, Lattice provide a bunch of libraries that say this FPGA has like a FIFO um, implementation. It turns out the FPGA doesn't have a FIFO implementation. What they have is a Verilog implementation of a FIFO, which is reasonably efficient on the stuff inside their FPGAs. And so we need, if you want to take a design that was targeting you know, the proprietary tools and now use them on the open source tools, we need a kind of compatibility layer that supports that. And we don't have that. Um, that's fine if you're writing for the open source tools first, because you probably never used these, but it's essential for allowing people to move from the proprietary environment to the open source environment. And we hope eventually everybody moves to this tooling. Um, then there's the Lattice ECP5. Um, this is documented by Project Trellis. Um, because Dave Shah is a machine, he has documented everything in the ECP5, um, including things like the high-speed SIRDES in the ECP5. Um, the ECP5 is kind of, if you're used to like the RTX7 series from Xilex, the ECP5 is pretty much a direct replacement for that in most cases. It has things like high-speed SIRDES that allow you to do PCIe, um, I think second gen, um, it allows you to do things like SATA. It has high speed memory interfaces. It, you can get it in parts with, I think, like 400 IO pins. Um, so, this is a pretty big, powerful FPGA. Um, and there's complete documentation for pretty much every bit in there. Not every bit has been used yet. Um, so, some of it might still be wrong. But as far as we can tell, um, that's completely documented. And if you want to find out um, how the Bitstream is designed, you can actually see a talk from Dave Shah um, at this link, where he goes through not only um, what the format is like, but how he went into doing the documentation for the ECP5. And um, I want to say a big thank you for Dave Shah for doing this, um, because it's enabled us to support basically a third um, FPGA type. And this is the big one you probably um, hear at the talk for. This is the Xilex Series 7. Xilex has, depending on who you talk to, between 50 and 80% of the market. Um, we're currently targeting what are called the Series 7 devices, which are very reasonably modern FPGAs that are still within the price range of hobbyists. Um, these are two, for example, um, Series 7 boards that you can buy with an RTX 7 on. Um, this one, I think, is about $100. If you're a student, you can get it for about half that price. Um, this one's about $150. Uh, get this one, it's got better features than this one. Um, and for the Series 7, we already have complete documentation for all the logic tiles. So that's the slice L's and the slice M. We have complete documentation for all the routing. Um, we have partial documentation for block RAM, definitely enough to use the basic modes of the block RAM. We, for example, don't have the FIFO mode or that type of thing. We have basic documentation for the IOBs, um, but we don't have any documentation for like the PCIe endpoint or the DSP blocks yet. We also don't have um, replacement tech libraries. Xilex says that their block RAM can be configured in about 10 bazillion different ways. It turns out the hardware can only be configured in about six. Um, and so somebody will need to write this mapping library um, if you want to use a design targeted at um, the proprietary tool chain. Um, if you just want to use open source, um, it's much easier to start from scratch. And 
This here is what an RTEC 750T looks internally. Um, each one of those squares is a tail. Um, this is what we understand so far um, fully. Um, so it's quite a lot of the FPGA. And this is definitely enough to do um, small projects with so far. Um, in this one, our green means that we support it. Um, red means that it's still not yet fully supported. Um, it's not a real tile. Um, so it's actually gray, um, but there's a whole bunch of cases where, for example, the block RAM, it only, it takes up like six tiles. Um, and so you actually see um, that kind of the columns going sideways where it kind of looks like a little fence, they are the block RAM. Um, and we have some understanding of them, um, enough to use basic stuff, um, but we don't have complete understanding. And because of the way a block RAM works, it actually takes up multiple tiles wide, uh, but Xilex kind of a, just represent it as one tile with a bunch of padding. Um, and so this is kind of a map of how a logic tile in the Xilex FPGA Series 7. And so this is actually across all of the Series 7, the Kintex, Artex, and Vertex series. Um, and you can see that there are zero unknown, which is great. So this is kind of a summary of where we are with the Bitstream documentation. Um, so we kind of support three um, different FPGAs. And both Lattice FPGAs we support have pretty much full documentation. And we're definitely getting there with the Series 7 documentation. Um, but there's more. Um, who knows what this diagram looks like? I think Keith has fallen asleep, so he might not recognize it. Um, but it's quite old, so our young audience may not. Um, it comes from the first ever Xilex FPGA um, that was commercially available. It cost you $55 to $80 and a $12,000 license fee. And it had 64 tiles in it. Um, and each tile, if you look at that, had one logic block and one flip flop. Um, so you're kind of like, why would I care about this? And the reason we're doing this is that we want to have a small demonstration system that we can teach people how to add new FPGAs to the Simbi Flow project. And the great thing about this is 64 tiles is roughly enough, small enough that you could get complete understanding of this part. It doesn't have block RAM. It has some routing and some logic. And it's very, very simple. And so we have complete documentation for this. Um, and it's a real FPGA. It's not a virtual FPGA. These were sold and, in fact, were used in many projects out there. And so we actually have complete documentation for that as well. Um, however, there are a lot more than this out there. And as I said, we have a pretty well-proven process for documenting the bitstream for FPGAs. Um, and a process that at least some lawyers are reasonably happy with. Um, so um, if you follow this process, um, those lawyers will be about equally as happy. Um, like all projects, um, there is a certain amount of um, risk. Um, but uh, it's better you probably contribute to us because we're a community and we have resources to help if things come up. Um, I would really love to see Spartan 6 and Spartan 3 support. Um, these are older FPGAs. But because they're older, they're frequently found much cheaper. And there are lots of things out there. Um, you might have noticed I've been 100% silent about Altera, or as Intel, as they now um, uh, called. Um, we need your help to document these, because um, I actually have no interest in Altera parts. 
I have a couple of Altera boards, um, but Xilex parts are probably useful enough, and Lattice parts are probably useful enough. Um, so if you an Altera fanboy, um, please help us document Altera parts. Um, but as I said, just because you have the bitstream documentation doesn't mean you can actually easily use it. You still need the synthesis, um, mapping, and place and route support. And that's these two parts of the toolchain. Um, as I said, we're using Yosis, no matter which place and route use um, system you use. Um, and both our uh, place and route systems are timing driven. Um, this is something that has only recently happened in the um, open source FPGA world. Um, and timing driven is really important if you want to do high speed designs or designs like memory controllers and stuff like that. And this is a kind of overview of the status. Um, as you can see, the ICE 40 been around for a long time. Um, it's very well supported by Yosis. Um, it's somewhat supported by Verilog to routing, and it's also fully supported by Nextpinner. And then Project X-Ray is mostly supported by Verilog to routing. Project Trellis is mostly supported by Nextpinner. And so if you're using a Lattice ICE 40 part now, and you're using a Rackner PNR, which was the previous um, place and route, open source place and route tool, you should definitely switch to NextPNR. Um, it's timing driven, it has this awesome GUI um, that lets you see what's going on. Um, and the developers say that if Arachna beats NextPNR in some way, it's a bug, you should log it, you should use it, and update your tutorials. There's a lot of you out there who have tutorials about using the ICE 40 please change them to use NextPNR rather than ArachnaPNR. ArachnaPNR is effectively end of life now. Um, so yeah, and you can help contribute to NextPNR just by using it. Um, so that's really awesome. Um, yep. This is also the FPGA that is on the TOMU, um, the FOMU. Um, if you want to find out more about the FOMU, um, and I have time at the end, I'll tell you about it. Otherwise, at afternoon tea, we will be having a BOF session on it. Um, as I said, this is a bag of 50, and I have a lot of these. And generally, my um, rule of thumb is if you contribute to one of my projects, I will give you hardware. So, um, NextPNR also supports Lattice ECP5. Um, this is an ECP5 design. I believe that is a Linux compatible um, design there. Um, it can definitely do IoT level microcontroller type designs um, without any problem. Um, Linux microprocessor socks, so you know, when you start to get the 64 bit with MMU and external memory, should work. Um, if it doesn't work, please log a bug. Um, it's still early. I wouldn't necessarily use it if you were designing the next spaceship or something like that. Um, but if you're a hobbyist, I'd definitely say check it out. Um, and yeah, Dave Shah is the maintainer of that um, ECP support, and he would love you to use it and report bugs and tell you him what doesn't work. Um, so we also have Lattice ICE 40 support in the other place and route tool um, called Verilog to Routing. Verilog to Routing is interesting in it's the most cited tool in FPGA research. Um, it has also been the basis of a number of commercial place and route tools who have taken it, forked it, and then hidden all their changes, which is kind of sad. Um, but Verilog to Routing is pretty cool. It's much slower and much bigger but it can do much more advanced things that NextPNR has not yet been able to do. Um, it's still very early. We'd love your help making it better. Um, if you just want to get things done, I'd recommend using NextPNR on the ICE 40 um, at the moment. Um, we could definitely love help here. 
Um, Virality routing is currently the only tool which supports Xilinx Series 7. Um, you can do things like um, a design which uses logic and distributed RAM. You can do a blinking counter. We have a RAM tester type design. Um, it's getting there. Probably in the next month or two, you'll be able to do IoT level um, socks. And definitely by the end of the year, we're targeting Linux level socks. Um, so if you were at the um, LCA last year, where you went through um, the Linux on an FPGA tutorial, by the end of this year, um, you should be able to do that tutorial without ever having to touch the proprietary tools, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. We're going to need your help to do that. Um, and um, there again is the status. Um, we're still working on 2064 support in something. Um, that we're only so many people, so um, we haven't really got past much that. And so now you know the status. Um, you can see we're not at equivalent to commercial tools yet. Um, we will want to get to that stage, and we believe it's totally doable. Um, you'd be silly if you used a commercial compiler for C++ or C these days. Um, LLVM and GCC are just so awesome. Um, we want to get to that stage with FPGA tool chains. And the only way we're going to do that is with your help. Um, but you might be sitting in the audience thinking, well, I'm not an FPGA expert, or I've never done bitstream documentation, or I barely know Verilog. Um, well, if you barely know Verilog, you're in a better state than I am. Um, but if you know Python, you can help, even if the only thing you know is Python. Um, a lot of the work we have to do is just translating data from one format to another format. Python's great at that. Um, and almost all our scripts, for example, managing the CI system is written in Python. Um, I'm a big Python fan, as people who know me um, will know. Um, so if you know Python, you can definitely help. If you know C++, you can also definitely help, even if the only thing you know is C++. Um, VPR, NextPNR, and a lot of the libraries that we use are all written in C++. Um, there's definitely a lot of areas we could improve. If, for example, you know how to use XML and C++ well together, I'm kind of sorry, but we'd love your help anyway. Um, a lot of the tooling uses XML on the back end because that's what various formats that we have to support are written in. Um, I'd love some help rewriting a lot of the XML produced by printf statements with something better. Um, so, um, and then we can hopefully replace XML with something else. Um, if you know Tickle, um, I'm also sorry. Um, <laughs> I have managed to avoid knowing Tickle, and I'm going to continue to manage to avoid doing Tickle, but it seems to be a standard language that the EDA tools in the industry use, and a lot of the Bitstream documentation is about making the EDA tools generate a lot of designs. And one way to do that is to use the Tickle APIs. Um, because the process we use for Bitstream documentation is we're not allowed to look inside the black box. But what we can do is produce a bunch of Verilog and a bunch of input and produce a lot of Bitstream output. And you take the two and you do cross-correlation. Um, I wasn't smart enough to think up this. Uh, Clifford uh, figured out how to do this and how to do this in a tractable way, an approachable way. I'm also not an expert on that. There are other people who I delegate doing that to, and they would love some help because it's a pretty unique club, the Tickle programmers. <laughs> If you're unfortunate enough to know Verilog, you can definitely help. As I said, all our simulation models are written in Verilog. We have a lot of tests that are written in Verilog. And we need those compatibility libraries, because there are people who have used the proprietary tool chains 
and would love to move to the open source toolchain, but don't want to have to rewrite everything from scratch. And so we need those libraries that map the proprietary constructs onto the open source constructs. Um, if you know XML, um, we'd love your help. Um, I know there are probably Java programmers in the field. Um, we don't use much Java, but we definitely have a lot of XML. If you know things like schemas um, and you know things like that, um, and transformation, because a lot of the XML formats are kind of old and crufty, we would like to move them towards a nicer format. So if you know how to translate XML from one format to another format automatically, we'd love help there. Um, my Excel TS proc is pretty terrible and make you cry. Um, so please help me by rewriting that in something less horrible. Um, the other thing <laughs> is hopefully you know English because I'm speaking in English. Um, you can help. A lot of the things we want to do is get people who haven't traditionally been involved in this environment, in this environment, into this environment. And like, the problem is I've been involved in FPGAs for about five, maybe ten years now, um, which means I no longer know what is missing from our documentation because I already understand what a logic block is. Um, and you might be sitting there going, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. Um, jump on IRC, ask us questions, and when we answer, go and put our answer in the docs. That is something you can do for us. Um, if you know English, you can definitely help. Um, and one of the things I say is like contribution to my projects isn't just pull requests. I love pull requests, but helping out on IRC, answering people's questions, contributing documentation will get you just as much hardware as doing C++ or Verilog. Um, if you are a sysadmin and you're not a coder, we need help with sysadmin stuff. Um, Joel can tell you interesting stories about my sysadmin prowess and how much he got in trouble by trusting my advice. Um, <laughs> so, um, if you know things like Docker, we'd love a quick setup environment that uses Docker and things like that. Um, I've managed to avoid Docker mostly, so um, please help there. And ultimately, if you have time to contribute, I will find you a task that is useful. Um, I am willing to spend the time to discuss with you and find out what you're most interested in because if you have the time and there's something that interests you about this project, um, I can find you something useful to do. Um, if you have questions, that's the GitHub URL. Um, we have mailing lists. Um, if you're scared to mail a, just a generic mailing list, please email me. I do get a lot of emails, so if I don't respond within about three days, please email me again. Um, it may have just dropped off my to-do list. I really do try and respond to all email I get. Um, but yeah, so that's the end. And I think I'm mostly on time. Um, I don't think it's changed yet, but hopefully we're on the way there. Um, I think it's a break now, is that correct? Um, so I will be around during the break. Um, if you're interested in Tomu FPGA, you can come and talk to me. Um, I sent an email to the mailing list. Um, I will give you these dev boards if you um, put in at least a minimum amount of work to get the environment set up and show that you're willing to do that. Um, so, I've got a bag full of them. Um, well, I better take my wallet out because I'm not giving that <laughs> away. I think their PGAs are probably worth more than what's in my wallet. Um, but yeah, I have a bunch of hardware. I don't want to take this hardware away with me. Um, so, please 
go and read that email, work through getting set up, ask questions if you get stuck during the setup. Like, um, definitely please ask questions as much as you can because if you're struggling with something, somebody else is probably also struggling with something and doesn't have the courage to ask the question. And so if we can fix that, we fix multiple people's problems. So, um, yeah. Cool. Thank you for coming.